So next up we have Preston So. Um, so usually Alex does this part, so I'm going to go from memory. Um, I know Preston from Colorado, where he uh, created the Southern Drupal Users Group, Southern Colorado Drupal Users Group. Um, and he's now presently at Acquia as a uh, lead in Acquia Labs um, program. So uh, he's going to be talking to us today about GraphQL. And take it away, Preston. Thank you. Awesome. How's it going, everybody? Uh, those are those are a couple of uh, really tough acts to follow. I mean, uh, visual regression testing, obviously a very big topic. YAML with Drupal 8, obviously huge. Um, so, uh, hello, I'm 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 Preston. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm based in New York, uh, and um, this is introduction to GraphQL. Um, before I move on, first of all, here's uh, where it's it's funny because the last time I presented this, actually, I forgot to get rid of the menu bar. So if you actually go to the bad camp recording of this same session, you'll see all of my bookmarks all lined up at the top. I'm not making that mistake this time. So. Um, anyways, so uh, uh, thank you, Ben, by the way, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I've been a Drupal developer since 2007. Um, I'm currently a development manager at Acquia Labs, um, which is a new initiative at Acquia. Uh, and um, I have, uh, you might have heard of me from various Drupal cons or Drupal camps in the area. Um, I'm a frequent speaker. And if you're a very uh, sort of avid follower of the Drupalverse, you may also have heard of me through a very controversial issue that I posted on Drupal.org recently. Um, anyways, so uh, before I begin, I would love to actually get a sense of the room. Um, how many people uh, uh, have worked with decoupled Drupal builds or know what decoupled Drupal is, headless Drupal? OK, good. So a good amount of people. Um, so uh, you know, Obviously, the whole concept of decoupled Drupal is you're using you know, basically Drupal as a RESTful backend. Um, and so how many of you have heard of GraphQL or have heard of React and these sort of technologies? OK, great. So we've got a good mix of people. What I'm going to do is I'm going to offer a, a sort of brief introduction to the Facebook open source ecosystem as well, just so we get a full understanding of, of, of sort of what's going on. So here's what we're going to cover. Um, the first is origins and motivations. Where did GraphQL come from? What is this? Why is, why is everybody freaking out about GraphQL? Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just another query language. What's going on? So I'll try to sort of uh, delve into that a little bit. Um, GraphQL and REST. So what, uh, what implications does GraphQL have on typical RESTful architectures? Now, I want to be very clear about this. I'm not talking about REST as the architectural style. I'm talking about REST as the sort of approach that many people have taken uh, the particular approach that many people have taken, which is namely a JSON payload-based HTTP API. So to be very clear about that, um, I'm not talking about Royal, you know, sort of Roy Fielding's concept of REST. I'm not talking about, uh, uh, you know, I'm solely talking about how people typically in these days are, are approaching RESTful architectures. Uh, third thing I'll do is to talk about GraphQL syntax, which I think is very useful to look at from the standpoint of, of uh, what's going on in Drupal. Um, and uh, I'll delve into a little bit about what makes GraphQL so powerful, which is its uh, complete uh, introspectability. Um, and then I'll also talk a little bit about sort of how GraphQL could fit in, or actually already does fit in, let's say, into the larger Drupal ecosystem. Uh, does that sound good? All right, let's get going. So what's that? In 10 minutes. Uh, OK, well, um, I didn't realize it's going to be 10 minutes. Is it? No, you have more than 10 minutes. I have more than 10 minutes. OK, good. Awesome. All right. If not, this is going to be a very quick presentation. <laughs> so OK, so the first thing I'll talk about is what is GraphQL? Um, so GraphQL, simply put, is a declarative query language um, and an application level protocol. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, this is a whole bunch of words that are just strung together. What does this actually mean? Well, um, so to begin, let me talk about the Facebook open source ecosystem just to get uh, our, our feet wet in, in what, what are all these people actually talking about. So first, you may have heard of React. It's all the rage right now in um, the front end world because of its very sort of fresh approach to state management on the client side, as well as this whole new thing that people are freaking out about and writing to their parents about called virtual DOM. So React, simply put, is a view-based component library, which means that it really serves as the view layer for what we know traditionally as MVStar, uh, MVC, MVVM frameworks that you may have heard of if you've worked with any sort of uh, uh, JavaScript um, uh, uh, implementations. So um, the oh, hello, hello, okay. So the sort of key 
differentiator of React from other uh, frameworks that are out there, such as Angular and Ember currently, or sorry, Angular 1, let me say, because Angular 2 is different, um, is that there's this thing called a virtual DOM, which is a diff-based mechanism of actually figuring out differences between two states of your UI. So for example, if you have a form that has a different render after an action takes place, um, instead of directly applying that manipulation onto the DOM, like jQuery or Backbone uh, would typically do, instead, uh, you have this abstract DOM, which lies outside of the regular DOM. And um, ah, 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 okay, there we go. All right, can anybody, okay, okay. Just let me know if you can't hear me or if I cut out. Um, and basically, based on this diffing, is able to figure out how intelligent, you know, how to intelligently sort of patch the page up. So um, now uh, to go to move forward from that, Relay is a framework that um, co-locates uh, basically data fetching logic and React view components. So now that so basically React is you know made up of components that you put together and that are nestable, and these components have to have some kind of data fetching needs, and I'll explain why in just a little bit. Uh, so what is GraphQL now, now that we've sort of covered those bases? Well, GraphQL is a query language that is initiated from the client side. So you, you, you write your queries from the client side. Um, and it's completely transport and storage agnostic communication, which means that it has no uh, dependency on HTTP necessarily. It has no dependency necessarily on its particular client, client side framework. Um, and basically what it does is very simple. You send from the client side a structure uh, to the server, and the server responds with data that mirrors that same structure. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, wow, that's actually a pretty nifty idea. How, do, how come we didn't think of this before? Uh, it's very interesting because actually Facebook has said all along, oh, huh, uh, we've been using this for years and years, actually. <laughs> and we're only going to open source it now uh, because we see the value of actually doing that. So um, basically, Facebook realized while it was creating its HTML5-based mobile apps and converting them into iOS and Objective-C powered apps that really what they needed was a way to really intelligently get data from the client side. So actually, um, React and Relay are actually um, these innovations that came about after GraphQL. GraphQL has been in, face, uh, in use at Facebook for a while. So if you have used um, the Facebook application on your, uh, on, on your iPhone or your Android, you've been uh, basically sending and submitting GraphQL queries. So uh, Nick Schrock, the creator of GraphQL, has this quote, which is, instead of placing data fetching logic in some other part of the client application or embedding this logic in a, in a custom endpoint on the server, we instead co-locate a declarative data fetching specification alongside the React component. So this is a very uh, important idea, which is you are specifying what data you want returned from the client side. Uh, it, you know, it's not really predicated on your API spec necessarily. Um, and you know, this, this is a very, very, very powerful idea, right? So, um, basically, the you 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 know you've, you've got this unified structure uh, across the payload, and I'll and I'll show you what that looks like in just a little bit. So um, here's a quick introduction to React because I know that a lot of us are not React people. Um, but for example, let's say that we have a hierarchy of data. Now React has this you know idea of view hierarchies. All client side frameworks that are modern currently have this idea of view hierarchies, which is that inside this article component. We have the title, path, and author components. And within the author component, we have name and location. Now, here's the thing. Typically, when you write a REST API, uh, when you, you know, write an, uh, an API specification and you want to have this data made available, what you might do is you might have each of, this, you know, each of these uh, Behouse's resources, um, such as, let's say, you have an article and you have the, you know, the author. Now, the problem becomes, though, that if you have an article resource that actually doesn't return any of the metadata that comes along with author, then you're kind of out of luck. You have to go back and go all the way back to your back end, uh, you know, go back to your API spec and add that in, you know, either through an ad hoc endpoint. You know, there, are there are lots of ways to do it, and I'm not going to delve into the RESTful part of things, but this is really hard. And Facebook realized this very quickly. They were like, we have to have two round trips to the server to get both the article information and the author information. That's kind of ridiculous. Um, so, uh, let's just uh, take, for example, here's a React component, and this is uh, uh, JavaScript syntax. And what you'll see is um, there's this uh, templating language that React uses called JSX, which is basically an interpolation of HTML um, into, uh, into JavaScript. React takes this, um, basically uh, interprets it, and, and parses it into JavaScript objects. So what we're doing here is we're fetching the article path, the article title, the author name, and the author location. Now, as you can see, uh, we actually want this stuff to be available from the article object, 
right? We don't want this stuff to be available as a separate object on this.props. So as a result, what we want to do is we want to structure this data in the same way on the client side. So here's our GraphQL query. So basically, uh, assuming that you have Relay installed, assuming you have you know, your React application, what we've got is before this, during the creation of your component, you're declaring a query which basically dictates the structure of the, of the data you want returned. So here we've got um, all of our uh, hierarchy defined. And what happens is, um, this is the query that we're sending. And if you think about this, well, this looks a, a heck of a lot like JSON, right? This is pretty much JSON. Um, and if we actually submit this query and, and we actually you know, uh, fire it, what we get is this result, which is a JSON object which contains uh, all of these fields that we have requested. And you know, as you can see, the server's response actually does mirror the client's desired query. right? So um, if you think that's something that's back to the future, it is. Because honestly, why haven't we thought of this before? Why haven't we allowed the client to dictate a lot of this stuff and prevent a lot of the friction that happens between server and client? Um, so with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about REST. And that should actually say RESTful architectures um, by the way, once again, when I'm referring to REST, I'm talking about the typical approach to RESTful architectures. So here's, uh, you know, how many, so, you know, a lot of people have built, you know, RESTful Drupal. And one thing that you've probably come across is that a lot of times it's really, really hard to adhere to sort of Roy Fielding's original ideas about REST. Namely that, um, you know, we have a lot of bloated responses, you have many round trips to the server, there's really no backwards compatibility, you have to do this really complicated versioning which has no semanticness and is just really confusing. Uh, it's also not introspective, right? Uh, this is a big problem with not only JSON but also, you know, all APIs, which is a lot of APIs that we typically um, write today do not have any sort of introspection. There's no introspection API, which means that we have no idea what the type system looks like, we have no idea what the schema looks like, and this is a big problem. So, um, you know, one of the pr big problems that I notice a lot when building uh, RESTful Drupal and, and seeing people build RESTful Drupal backends is that, you know, a lot of endpoints are very specific and very tailored, right? Now, as we saw with the example of the author, you know, the article and author, this gets very hairy very quickly because, um, uh, you know, relational uh, operations, things that are, uh, you know, that, 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 are, that are really, not, you know, should be uh, sent back in, in a single response are sent back in two separate responses because you've had to fire two separate requests. Um, and also you've got the problem of ad hoc endpoints, right? How many people have, you know, had their front-end developer say, hey, I need this data now and I need this, but then you're like, oh, well, this endpoint is already serving this data to this client. I'm just gonna, you know, provision a whole new endpoint for you so you can have your own, your own client. Well, this gets very out of hand very quick because now you've got 15 million endpoints to actually figure out how to organize. Uh, it's a big problem. Um, and then also you, you get response bloat. So this is one of the biggest problems with, uh, with the typical approach to RESTful architectures right now, which is that because of these changing requirements and because of the constantly evolving needs of our data and how it gets sent to the client side, a lot of these clients that only have limited data might have to deal with increasingly large payloads. And now if you're an IoT application, let's say, and you really want that really low, you know, small size payload that you're getting, um, that is not a good idea. You, know, you should not be getting sent the entire Android map of data when you request, when, you know, when you're a Roku application or something like that. So obviously, um, you know, this kind of, how, how do you appeal to all the clients and make them all happy at the same time? And also still be performant, right? This is, this, is the, this is the problem. Of course, then you have many round trips, as I said earlier. You know, if, if, if you've got a lot of complex relationships, you've got a lot of stuff going on in your, in your actual uh, desired response, then, you know, you're going to have a lot of uh, uh, client server round trips. And if you're using Drupal, which is not well known for its lightweight and tiny bootstrap, you will be also bootstrapping Drupal as well every time. Um, so that delays the render. Um, so, and also there's no backwards compatibility, right? Um, REST APIs are versions typically. You'll you know, often see people using the scheme API slash V1 slash resource. Um, and so what happens is that you know, as client needs evolve, uh, basically these versions are, get very, very hard to manage. You, you've got these sort of colossally growing list of versions. So queries have to be rewritten against the new API. You have to basically you know, update, every, you know, update everything everywhere. It's a, it's a big pain, right? So, and then finally, as I said earlier, there's no introspection. We, 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 can't, we can't figure out what's a valid value for this field. Um, you know, there's, there's no native schema. There's no formalized type system. And so this makes validation on the client side especially very difficult. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about how GraphQL solves some of these problems. Well, 
basically, the, the thing to keep in mind here, and I, and I want to be clear because I think a lot of people have misconceptions about GraphQL. GraphQL is a specification. It's not a framework. It's not you know, something that you can download and plug in. Drupal uh, has to write a GraphQL server, right? Uh, basically, what happens is you want to uh, allow these clients to hook into to Drupal and get this data. So Drupal has to manage all of this on the back end and serve the correct data. Um, and it can do that in a single bootstrap, and it can do that in a single server round trip, assuming that you have GraphQL logic on the server side uh, that, that basically handles this stuff. And I'll talk a little bit about um, what it means for Drupal in just a little bit. Um, so basically what this means is that if you have a shared endpoint, that's you know, for all of your clients, um, you can basically have all of the resolution of those queries happen uh, on the server side. Um, and also uh, tailored responses, right? Once again, the structure of the payload that you receive actually mirrors the structure of what you send. Um, and a GraphQL server typically returns a single response. Um, and that's pretty much flexible enough to accommodate a wide variety of different relationships. And I'll show you in just a little bit what that means. And of course, what, no matter what version of your API you have, if you have basically spaghetti versioning, <laughs> um, you know, your client can basically provide the same, exact same query to multiple versions of that API. You don't have to worry about whether it's the V2 API or the V4 API or whatever. And you can expect a common response from every single one of them. And finally, GraphQL also has a very, very uh, uh, extensible schema and type system. Um, actually, it's been compared quite often to the, to the Go type system. Um, so why GraphQL? Why do we want to explore doing this anyway? Because as we all know, more abstraction on top of more abstraction on top of more abstraction, you know, sometimes stuff falls, you know, falls apart, right? Well, this is very different because what we're really doing is we're abstracting away a lot of the distinctions that make it so hard to create something like a, tra a transport agnostic or a product, you know, a, a, an application level approach to querying data. Um, so it's a common vernacular between server and client. That's how it's been designed. Um, and it's similar enough to JSON to be very easy to onboard. Anyone who knows, um, you know, just you know, just like the last presentation with YAML, anyone who knows JSON can use GraphQL. Basically, um, so GraphQL. If you have a server on the server, uh, if you have a GraphQL server that you've built, um, it, it basically prevents any unnecessary requests or or, or bootstraps, which is really good news for Drupal. Um, so uh, basically, once again, the HTTP protocol is just one of many ways that you can transmit these queries. Um, it doesn't really matter. And, and also, the database doesn't matter you know, either. If you're using MongoDB or if you're using MySQL, a GraphQL server couldn't care less, right? Because that's the goal, is we shouldn't care. Um, now, OK, so obviously, I've been extolling the values of GraphQL you know, for, for hours and hours. But there are some criticisms, right? Once again, uh, the abstraction on top of abstraction is, is a very bad thing. Um, and basically, you can you know, provision more you know, REST endpoints, of course. There's, there's, there's solutions for this during the, you know, in the typical approach to REST. Um, and of course, HTTP, people are saying, well, we're ignoring HTTP. Uh, you, know, you, can you can have multiple uh, parallel network requests. And um, HTTP2 will actually probably mitigate this to a great extent. So why do we need it in the first place? And then, of course, HTTP content negotiation, right? You can actually have all of that versioning take place um, through content negotiation, which means that at a single path, you can have, you know, you don't need that API slash v2 thing anymore, really. Um, uh, and also, HTTP has a built-in type system as well. Um, and, you know, of course, it can, you know, tie into things like JSON schema. Uh, I'm getting a little bogged down, so I'm going to push ahead. But if you want to get going now with this, uh, because the Drupal module for GraphQL is not currently ready, uh, please feel free to, to get going with this GraphQL server. Um, so let's talk a little bit about syntax. Well, GraphQL models two types of operations. And I say models because it doesn't actually execute them. It, that, you know, all that actually happens on the server. So we have a query, which is a read-only fetch, which means that you are not affecting anything when you do a read operation. Makes a lot of sense. Mutation is a write operation. It performs a write. And then nested within that write operation is a further fetch. So I'll show you how that looks when we, when we get to, uh, to mutations. So you can have named operations, uh, which are case sensitive. And you can also have anonymous queries as well. Um, and then basically what happens now, so this, um, this actually, this syntax has evolved a little bit. Um, the GraphQL spec has been an, you know, under heavy flux recently. Um, but uh, basically, originally, this was designed with, uh, with comma separation. Now there is no comma separation. Um, so basically, you have carriage return separated fields, uh, which 
are basically discrete pieces of information. And as you can see, what you get back as JSON is, is right there on the screen. Now, fields can also describe relationships with, with other data. You can have uh, nested relationships. You can have, uh, you know, basically the rich hierarchical uh, context that I described earlier with the uh, with, with the original example. Yes. Uh, I'll just repeat the question. Go ahead. Uh, you, have to, you have to send some sort of you have to send some sort of ID, right, mm -hmm. to get that information. Yep. You're going, to go, you're going to show that. Yep, yep. It's a little yep. confusing to see it without that in there. Sure, sure, yep. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there in just a second, right? All this currently assumes that, um, that there's, you know, a single, you know, a single, you know, thing to be selected. Um, I haven't quite gotten there yet because it's, it's going to be in the next slide. Here we go. Arguments. <laughs> that answers your question. Oh, yeah, so, so, the, so the question was um, there has to be some kind of an argument that provides the ID for what you're actually fetching. Um, and, and, and we just got there. Um, so there's so there's your argument, and of course you can apply arguments anywhere you want to. And I'll talk about how actually to define these arguments because that's really compelling as well, and it really gives a lot of insight into the awesome level of introspection. Oh, thank you so much. The awesome level of introspection that GraphQL uh, gives you uh, natively if you follow the spec. So let's go ahead and push forward. So as you can see, we're fetching the 72 by 72 uh, uh, um, that avatar from the CDN. And um, you know we're, we basically got all of our data, and it's one specific person's data. Um, you can have more than one argument, and you can also have aliasing of fields, which means that this is this is actually probably one of the most important and compelling features of GraphQL, which is that if you typically use a JSON API, and you get your you know dedicated uh, response payload, what you're going to get is something that you can't really change until you get to the client side, right? So you're kind of hamstrung because if you want to change the way this is going to show up in your React component or whatever you're building, it's pretty hard to do. You know, you have to do some, you know, basically client side patching of this and add further logic to the client side. It's not pretty. So instead, if we've got a user of UID1, which we all know is the admin, um, why don't we just alias it that way? And what comes back is this really nice object with admin. And this is all according to the spec. Um, and so basically, you can also disambiguate between um, identically named fields, which is really powerful as well. Um, and so as you can see, you can fetch uh, you know, assets of different sizes. Um, these are all sort of really superfluous and, and you know, outlandish examples. Um, you know, these are not actually like uh, you know, real. Uh, you can't, you know, I don't have a server set up where you can <laughs> uh, you know, make these calls. Um, but there's also this concept of fragments. And fragments are basically, uh, you know, an atomic unit that allows you to reuse this, you know, selection sets um, across multiple places. So uh, we have a fragment called content on a page, and that's actually a type object. I'll talk a little bit more about type objects soon. Um, so uh, basically, fragments allow you to keep your, your document clean when you actually submit it. And you can have basically, you know, based on the type of uh, uh, the, the, the um, type object, um, that you actually have on the server, you can dictate um, how and what fields get actually uh, sent as part, or, or you know, are actually included as part of the um, eventual object. So um, with that being said, let's go ahead and uh, move forward. So fragments can be nested as well, um, and I, I, you know, so I want to push ahead a little bit um, to get to uh, some of the cool stuff, but. Uh, basically, we've got inline fragments as well, um, and uh, you know I think that this syntax is is is, is very compelling um, because you know we one of the things that we always have problems with is the inability to see what's going on is the inability from the client side when you you know basically this is the problem with the typical approach to RESTful architectures, which is that if you have a Drupal site and you submit a request that's formatted this way, you're going to get a response that's formatted totally differently. And that, you know, that's kind of, you know, really, really hard to get to sort of wrap your head around sometimes. Um, and so, you know, this really resolves that. Um, and of course, you have uh, fragments that can also be anonymous as well. Um, now, variables you can have as well. So let's say that you have some dynamic insertion of variables into your query later by, uh, you know, some kind of concatenation that goes on uh, on the React side. Um, you can provide that variable, and then that variable is used later during the selection process. 
Uh, and then there's also directives as well. I don't want to get too in the weeds here because uh, I do realize this is probably not too exciting without a live uh, ability to see these in action. Um, but anyways, uh, so directives, you know, you can use them to include and exclude fields, to, you know, based on certain parameters such as, and, and so this is, this, this is really interesting because it basically, you know, applies kind of programmability into um, uh, this, this, uh, this process. Uh, you can do things like skip, you know, you've got all these opportunities to actually hook into the way the query is going to be sent. Um, and so this is very important because, you know, we want to keep our separation of concerns, right? And um, uh, basically, you, you don't want any of this to sort of leach into your client-side application. You want this to be dynamic. You want this to be something that is uh, reusable. Um, and so that, you know, this is what that gives you. Okay, so let's move on to mutations because I think that's one of the more important topics here. Now, um, there's, a lot of, there's still a lot of debate about this syntax in the GraphQL community, which, um, which is about this, this idea of basically this mutation action. Um, and one of, the, one of the things to remember here is that um, it's a very different syntax from the, from the query syntax in that the top level field that you have here, the favorite article, is the only thing that doesn't resolve, um, that doesn't resolve item potently, right? So that means that every time you fetch your favorite count on your node, you're always going to get the same one, no matter how many times you perform the operation. Um, however, when you actually perform the mutation operation, that does change what's on the server, right? So what this is doing right now is it's saying, let me do my favorite article action on article ID 992, um, and then fetch the favorite count afterwards. As I said at the very beginning of the syntax uh, crash course, the um, uh, the actual uh, um, uh, the actual write operation is favorite article, and then everything inside of it is just a read. It's just a fetch. So what we get in, you know, in return is this. And as you can see, there's no top level field anymore. We don't, we don't see that come back. And this is where the biggest, this is where the heart of the controversy lies, which is, well, didn't we just talk about how the JSON payload has to look exactly the same as what was sent? What is going on here? Right? So um, there's still a lot of discussions going on about that. Um, now, this mutation in particular uh, basically su supplies a new title to a particular node before fetching the new title. So what you get back. Before the mutation, you get that, and then you update the title, and you get that. OK, so we've gotten that uh, out of the way. And mutations are still a very sort of uh, you know, immature part of GraphQL, um, and uh, you know, you know, obviously still being talked about quite a bit. But I want to talk a lot right now about the type, and schema, uh, the type system and um, schema introspection that we have in GraphQL, which is probably the most interesting and the most compelling feature, and is really applicable to, to, to Drupal. So in GraphQL, you can define your schema. And these schemas actually, uh, uh, you know, are, 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 are meant for query validation. They're meant to tell you what types it supports, what, you know, what directives you have available. Um, and so basically, Facebook recommends that a GraphQL server generally should have these base types, um, these scalar types. Um, and, uh, you know, if you don't have these, basically, you're, you're you know, any, anyone who writes a typical GraphQL query might run into some problems. Now you have these things called type objects. So basically, when you declare a type object within your GraphQL schema, now, once again, I want to say we've switched gears here. We've gone away from the actual query document of GraphQL, which is what you saw contained in that React component, and now we've moved to the actual definition of the schema. Now, uh, this type object basically dictates the types that are valid um, as, uh, you know, to be sent as part of the request, um, and then also gives you, a, or sorry, that, that's meant to be returned. And then it gives you basically a, a really nice way to introspect what you're looking at. Now you can get this, you can get this output from, from GraphQL. And I'll, and I'll show you exactly how to do that in just a second. Um, so types can refer to other objects that you've created. So if you've you know, got, got something, you know, some, you know, some, some other object that you want to refer to. And, but the thing is that's what's important is that um, if a type object is nested within another type object, um, you know, some field has to be selected within that object. So related in this case is uh, is, a, is type object node, is type node, and you know it, it assumes that you've got something, a, a field inside there that's basically required. So that's a valid query, but this one is not. So um, object field arguments. This is where you define your arguments, um, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, you've got your, um, you know, basically you, you you know you can provide a validator for this and and get all of this, uh, you know, wrapped up into your GraphQL server. Uh, and then you've got, you know, basically, if you if you know Optidorian PHP, this might be familiar looking, uh, which is that you can have basically reusable, 
I really don't want to call them classes, but you know, interfaces which basically give you uh, a means to do basically what was already done previously with fragments. Um, and then uh, types that are invoked within type objects can refer to these interfaces, and then you know you've got you know basically more introspection. Uh, and then of course, so this is where fragments come in, uh, which is that on node syntax refers to the actual type, um, and you can basically say, hey, if this type is a node, give me the body. All right, one of the last things I want to cover with this is unions, which is really interesting because um, you can basically uh, provide, uh, you know, different types of objects as part of the response, right? Which is very interesting from the standpoint of, you know, basically allowing this flexibility and having a single endpoint. Um, you, you really want to be able to take in any input and, and give the output that it, that it really wants. So in this case, what's going on is if what comes in is a node type, op, is, a, is, a, is, is a type node, we're going to give you these fields. If it's a text, you know, if it's a taxonomy term, and I'm using these these Drupal terms really loosely here. Um, and if it's a taxonomy term, we're going to give you the, the title and the overarching vocabulary that surrounds it. Um, and so, what that means is that we can actually write fragments according to that type bifurcation, and actually give you a selection process, um, which gives you know, which basically gives you that. And so, you can actually write these really powerful queries uh, without having to do any extra work. Um, so uh, basically, you can have exhaustive introspection of the schema. How do you do that? You basically submit a query the same way that uh, it should work uh, when it comes to any REST API. You should be able to introspect any REST API. Um, but instead, GraphQL has this built into the, spec in, into the specification, so you actually get an idea of what's going on. And so this returns this really nice output, which gives you full introspection into the types, into what types are declared. Um, and how the hierarchy works. And then you can also use the uh, underscore underscore schema field as well. So anyway, so I thought that was a you know, really quick introduction. I, I didn't want to, you know, stick too much to the, to the syntax because it's not something that's really applicable right now. But I just wanted to give you a look at how you know, nice and how, you know, how easy this is for someone who's a front-end developer. I come from a front-end development background. And you know, I know you know you know very very well how you know hard it is for front enders and back enders to come together in, into the same room and play a game of chess. And I'm just kidding, but you know what I mean. It, you know, it, you know, basically, we we really want front enders and back enders to play nicely, and, and GraphQL is an abstraction that allows this to take place. Give me the data I want. Simple as that. Um, all right. So now I want to sort of delve into what we're really concerned about uh, to finish things off, which is what does this mean for Drupal? Right? So we've talked about what this means for you know, React, what this means for all these other things. What does this mean for Drupal? Well, um, so if you know uh, Sebastian Seamson, he works for Zen Stations out in Austria. Um, he was featured in the Barcelona uh, keynote by Dries. Um, and he's currently working on a GraphQL module for Drupal 8 using the native NB system and the type data API that we have in Drupal 8. Now, um, this, uh, if you navigate to this URL, you will see the sort of beginnings of that module. Unfortunately, it has not been updated in a couple months, and it's still missing the most important part, which is a which is an underlying uh, low-level PHP library, which actually uh, you know helps to uh, uh, bridge the gap between Drupal and providing these responses. So um, that I highly encourage you to check out. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of interesting work going on there. Um, and the module is not currently installable, um, but it will soon be on GitHub. Now, if you're interested in actually debugging some of these queries, if you have an existing server, such as that rising stack server for GraphQL, or you want to set this up on your own on, let's say, a MongoDB server, or, or sorry, a MongoDB database, or what have you, um, you can use Graphical, which is a GUI for testing and debugging queries. And I'll show you what that looks like uh, at the very end um, here. Oh, well, right here. Let's do that. So. Um, let me just go, okay, come on. Okay, so let me just, um, how do I full screen this here? All right, so let me just give you a quick tour. This is the same video that was presented at, at DrupalCon Barcelona, but this goes to show how easy this can be. So what we've got here is we've got a bunch of nodes that have been created in Drupal 8, uh, which are basically DrupalCon events, right? They're content type event. And they've got certain custom fields, including city, region, and year. 
And what we really want is we want to have a really good way to actually go in and look at these uh, node objects. So here's the, here's the graphical testing interface. And as you can see, we're writing a query that selects an entity, uh, and it goes through the entity system, and it gets the node of ID3, and it gets the value of the title. And as you can see, this is the JSON payload that comes back. Now, what we want to do is let's do it. Let's let's query a view. Let's go in, and this is the this is the default admin slash content view of Drupal, by the way. Um, and now we've got all of our various titles of all of our nodes, which are you know basically the the Drupal cons that have that have occurred in the past. Now, let's supply an argument, which is let's just get those uh, conferences which took place in Europe. And if we apply that argument, what you'll see is that now it's limited to just Amsterdam, Prague, Munich, London. There's no, uh, you know, there's no Washington DC in there. There's no Denver in there, for example. And then what we can do is using our uh, our type system, entity node conference is a type within the GraphQL schema. We can actually get some custom fields out as well. And so what you see here is we're selecting um, the city, the year. Um, and we're getting these really nice results. And as you can see, if you think about this from the context of a front developer, this is actually really easy to traverse and work with. Um, you're not really dealing with a whole lot of other data that you have to figure out how to, how to, how to parse out. Um, and then we can also select the user as well. So really cool stuff. Uh, and I think that's almost the, oh yeah, and then this last thing is just a quick demo of the aliasing uh, ability, which changes that UID field name to the author in the response payload. So um, this, is, this is really cool. I mean, how awesome was that, right? Uh, I, and, and, and this is without even having seen like how this would actually look on the client side and how you actually work with this. But, um, so let me just get out of here so we can go back to the, to the slides here. Um, so what are the next steps, right? We've seen how cool this is. We've seen what a, what a great idea this, this could really be for Drupal. Uh, well, the next steps for the module are access control, mutation support, um, the ability to, to configure these schemas and types using, let's say, YAML, maybe, uh, or a, an actual UI within Drupal. Um, so with this in mind, what's the future of GraphQL? Uh, well, this is only uh, you know the first step. There's a, the the spec is still in heavy flux. The last update was in October 2015, so this is still a very very fast moving target. Uh, features are still being added to it. It's still in a lot of flux. Uh, between when I gave when I when I first started writing the presentation, in fact, and when I gave it at Bad Camp, things had changed already in the spec. And let me tell you, you know, rewriting a whole deck is is no fun. Um, so Facebook is currently in the process of rolling out a whole bunch of tools which are really good for GraphQL. Uh, you know about Relay, you know about this stuff. They're open sourcing a lot of these, uh, a lot of these tools to add and, and, and put more energy into the, uh, the uh, Facebook open source ecosystem which encompasses React and Relay and all these great ideas. Uh, so uh, in recent days, or that should be recent months, uh, WebSocket support was announced um, and, and I'm not sure where this has gone quite yet. I need to look into this myself, but um, should be pretty interesting from the real-time standpoint. Now what about what we're really worried about, uh, which is how we can actually use this, which is decoupled Drupal. Well, um, basically anyone who's using a React application uh, that, that's backed by a Drupal backend will see your benefit happen immediately because this is fully integrated into the React ecosystem. You can use this right now with Relay. If you have a Flux implementation that you're using with React, you can use this right now. Uh, there's nothing stopping you. Um, but also, since GraphQL is transport agnostic and also you know, framework agnostic, you can use Angular, you can use Ember. As long as you put all the pieces together and, and, and send the query, you, you, can, you can make this work with any sort of front end that you want. And this is what's really the most powerful uh, idea of GraphQL, which is I want any front end to be able to query any backend, and you get this sort of common uh, abstraction that lies above all of these things. So you don't have to worry about the fact that you're using SOAP for something versus HTTP, or you're using you know, some other protocol. There's, there's a whole lot of, uh, of interesting possibilities here. Um, so you know, in a single bootstrap, Drupal could serve these, these, these really intelligently formed responses that are really tightly, tightly catered to your needs. And of course, the same server can interpret many different query structures. It's the same idea. 
Now, I want to open this up for a little bit of discussion uh, because I think that's what, um, you know, I think a lot of us are really curious about where this could go and where the sort of future directions of, of this technology and this idea goes. What is the future of technologies like GraphQL? Well, so some of you might have heard of uh, Netflix's Falcor. How, how, like, how many of you have heard of Falcor? Okay, so Falcor takes a very different approach. Um, Falcor puts a lot more of the onus of actually, uh, uh, you know, batching these queries and, and making them performant on the client side, which means that from the client side, you put in some sort of logic. It's path-based, which means that you're, you know, basically Falcor gives you the ability to, to, to call for multiple paths and consolidate those queries. Um, now, I don't, I don't know a whole lot about Falcor. Maybe someone else can speak to it, but um, there's a lot of discussions going on right now about which is the better approach, right? Should we put another abstraction on top or should we put more of the onus on the client side to actually, you know, resolve these differences? And should there really be an abstraction like this, you know, further because it, once again, adds more overhead, you gotta, you know, have your GraphQL server, all of that stuff. What is the future of web services in Drupal in light of GraphQL? Um, so this is currently being worked on right now in the Drupal 8 module GraphQL. Um, and uh, basically what it does is it just lies on top of the REST server. It gives you a JSON payload, you know, typical JSON response um, out, of the, uh, uh, out, of, out of Drupal. Um, but what's coming back, obviously, is an interpretation of the, is, is the um, response um, coming from the interpretation of that GraphQL query. So what is the future of decoupled architectures, decoupled CMS architectures in the front end with GraphQL? And what's the future of RESTful architectures in general um, and the server-client relationship in light of GraphQL? Well, there's a lot of uh, interesting debate going on right now uh, with the advent of these IoT applications or Internet of Things applications where the response payload, the size of the response payload becomes a really, really important factor in performance. Um, things like GraphQL are really interesting. These ideas are, are, are very interesting. Um, of course, uh, you know, the idea of being able to query anything you want to from any client you want to is a very, is a very interesting and compelling one. Hello? So um, this, you know, this is just some food for thought. I, I wanted to pose these questions uh, sort of out in the open just because this is a very active space. This is a very sort of fast moving space. And I think there's a lot of potential for some really exciting work to be done here in the future. So with that in mind, thank you very much. Uh, I hope this was useful. Thank you. Woo! All right, thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Preston? We have one here, we have one here. Yes, Mike. Um, so I have lots of questions, but a couple things. Uh, so I've been working with the open source world for 15 years, and I've seen lots of projects done and lots of projects failed. Um, this sort of uh, Facebook ecosystem is um, an interesting sort of hybrid that reminds me a lot in a very clever way of Adobe, where part of it was open and part of it isn't. And then something they decide to change something on their back end, like they're, they're using GraphQL for their database, for their graph database. And they may decide they want to change it for you know some arbitrary reason. And you may know that they just canceled the, what was it, the um, Parse project, you know, sort of out from under everybody. Yep. So it's really tricky dealing with these companies that have their own agenda. React, I think, is interesting because it's gone through a sort of two or three iterations where they're now completely open source, not just versions of React, but implement or improvements on React, like Redux, for example. So I think this is really interesting. What I would suggest is working very closely with the JSON API people, which is another very mature JSON-based web services system. And there's a lot of um, smart people like the cats behind that. Um, and just try to take the really good parts of um, GraphQL and build them into something that is truly independent of Facebook. And because you, otherwise you can get burned in, in a variety of ways um, unexpectedly. Uh, yeah, that was a very good question. Um, so the, the question had to do with sort of the open source uh, and proprietariness of GraphQL and the whole React ecosystem. And I think this is a very important debate that's been going on. Um, so the first response I would have to that is that um, uh, GraphQL uh, is very much open source in the sense that they've released their spec, right? So there's a spec document you can actually go to, which you know lists out all the language features. And um, uh, you know it, it, it doesn't look like something that's gonna be pulled anytime soon. And um, 
you know, once again, you know, GraphQL is completely back and agnostic. It's not meant to be something that um, is tied to a particular, you know, server implementation or architecture. Uh, it's it's really meant to be flexible. Um, however, that being said, I do definitely see the concern. Um, there's been a very, very large debate raging right now in the React community, actually, about their licensing. Um, and this is a, you know, so uh, if you if you don't know, if you're not familiar, uh, React is licensed under under BSD and is also uh, there's also a, a, a patents clause hidden within this licensing, which basically states that if you sue Facebook for any unrelated reason, if you sue Facebook because they violated your privacy, they have the right to revoke your access to uh, React. Which means that if you have an application and you're, I don't know, like, you know, like Oracle or something, and you decide to sue Facebook for some completely arbitrary, unrelated reason, let's say you've got a patent, they can revoke your access and you have to shut down all your React applications. Uh, so this has been a GitHub issue on the WordPress Calypso project, which uh, uses React, um, and also on the React project itself. People are very concerned about the implications of this on open source projects and on open source in general. Um, so I think it's, it's, you know, the answer I would say is that it's kind of mixed, right? We see Facebook uh, uh, being very open source and, and keeping up with the open source ethos by releasing the spec and encouraging people to build off of the spec, but then we see sort of this, you know, other, you know, this sort of, you know, other side of them, which says, well, actually, we don't want you to use our stuff completely uh, according to your own ideas. Um, so uh, I hope that answers at least some of that question. All right, we have one question there, and then we have one right here. OK, uh, hey, um, this is Scott. Uh, my question is, how, so I know you were describing how Drupal could be used as a, as a server in this, according to the spec. Um, and I was thinking maybe that was more of a proof of concept than an actual end goal of reality. And my question to you is um, how, so there's a spec and there are servers, essentially. How does caching work with this kind of querying? Because it sounds like every query is different. You know, in this sense, you're not really hitting endpoints with some sort of a TTL, or you're not really hitting, you know, you're not combining known reusable queries. You're, you're literally just like, giving a different kind of package every time. So I'm curious what the stra caching strategies are, except for like a highly performance server. Or maybe that is the answer, but I'm curious. Thanks. Sure, that's a very good question. And um, I'm gonna preface that by saying I'm not a caching expert, so I'm probably the wrong person to ask that question. Um, but uh, you know, my, from my sort of cursory reading on the, on the, on the subject, uh, what people are saying is that you know, you're going to need to have caching both on the client side and the server side. Basically, if you have a bunch of queries that are repeated all the time, that should be cached somewhere on the client side. Um, and then the server also has to be intelligent about what it's serving as well. So, you know, the, the, the sort of, and I, and I, you know, and, and I apologize for the sort of incomplete answer, but, you know, the, 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 the sort of real difference is that um, now the onus is on both the server and the, and, the, and the client side. Does anyone have any exposure to uh, caching in GraphQL? No. Yeah, I don't think anyone, this is something that, like, there's no blog post on this yet. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I was just wondering about uh, paging. So, you know, obviously, if I said, give me the users and I have a billion users, I don't want one list of a billion users. So, is that built into the spec? Uh, so I, as far as I know, the way to do that is is, is through um, is through arguments and through that, right? You you give basically an argument that's something like count, and the the, the GraphQL uh, implementation on the on the server side will interpret that and say, hey, you only want ten. Um, however, the um, uh, paging is uh, very because you want to be able to get page ten, let's say, of five hundred pages. Um, that's that's still that's something that I actually am not quite sure of, um, but. Um, you know, definitely something to explore uh, as a as a problem space. Um, I think, I believe, Falcor has a solution uh, for paging. I may be mistaken about that, but other questions. Anyone? All right. Thank you very much, Preston. Woo!